Well, a very warm welcome to you. My name is Clint, if I haven't met you yet, and thank you for joining us for 3CR Online on this wonderful Sunday morning, which is our final Sunday of Level 4 Lockdown. Uh, we have got some amazing uh, announcements as we kick into our, our meeting. The first one being is that uh, a few weeks ago we made a plea to you wonderful people of 3CR and said we're going to start a PS Arms account which is an account that we've opened for those that are needy and those that are struggling in our community at, the ta at this time. And um, from that announcement to now, 600,000 Rand has come in from amazing people like yourselves. And we have had the privilege of a leadership of being able to distribute those finances to different families and households that are in need at this time. And it has been incredibly humbling. And we are so grateful to you and really want to convey our gratitude to you at this time for partnering and participating and teaming with us on that matter. It really, really is very humbling. The other amazing news is that as of tomorrow, uh, the Funda Linda Fenter team are going to be on site and we begin building uh, the base again, which is very, very amazing news. And we know that they are raring to go. And as a team, they are ready and excited. And uh, we have the privilege and pleasure of having them back on site again, which is great, great news. Uh, as we move forward into the rest of our meeting, I would like to welcome Roy up and he's going to be making an announcement as to what our stance is as a leadership as we enter into level three lockdown. So Rory, if you could please make your way up now. Well, 3CR, good morning. It's actually Friday morning. It's really cold in Pretoria, but for you watching, it's Sunday morning. And uh, uh, you know, the Bible says, greet one another with a holy kiss. Uh, we can't do that. I'm so sad about that. Um, and um, we're not allowed to hug. Uh, praise God. But uh, we are missing you and we're missing the time together. And, uh, but the word has been going out and people have been responding in amazing ways to Rockstar and Peter. And I, obviously our president uh, sat down this week and, and started speaking about our ability to meet again. And I just looked at him. I thought that the amount of pressure that must be on that man to try and make everybody happy. And uh, I know as a business person, I, I have a restaurant and uh, the restaurant association is, is, is going against the government because I want restaurants open because no meetings, no money, no people sitting, no money. And, and I, think, uh, I think it's exactly the same in faith-based movements, uh, no meetings, no money. So there's incredible pressure on the government to, to make a decision around faith-based meetings and all of those things. But we said we're going to support our government and our government have given us some license. But 50 people in a community the size of 3CI is actually, it's not really a solution. It's um, how do you social distance children? You're not actually allowed to sing hymns loudly. And we like singing hymns loudly. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper. And as we sing them, we're spitting around and you're not allowed to do that. So... Uh, it's a difficult time on how to facilitate. We're not allowed to meet in homes yet. And uh, so our home groups can't meet and you can't have a Sunday service in homes with home groups. And, and so we've got to go back to some of the original things we asked about what is good for our people. And uh, we met as an eldership over Zoom. We've had amazing meetings, amazing prayer times, distributing finances. But I just want to share with you two scriptures, Romans 14. And it starts like this, the weak and the strong. And it says, accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. One man's faith allows him to eat everything, but another man's faith who's weak eats only vegetables. The man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not. And the man who does not eat everything must not condemn, the man who does eat everything must not condemn the man who does, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. The church is not just for the strong. The church is for the weak. And it's not for those just who have got strong faith. It's also for those who have got weak faith. And it's not just those who have got strong uh, convictions. It's also for those who have got weak convictions. And it's not just those who have got strong consciences. It's also for those who have got weak consciences. It's not just for those who have got strong bodies. It's also for those who have got weak bodies. And we've got people in our church that have got preconditions, emphysema, uh, TB, uh, sugar diabetes, uh, some people are, are, are subject 
Uh, some people have got cancers, are subject to getting diseases quickly. And so, so we've got some weaker members of our church. And actually, the church is one of the only organizations in the world where the weak survive. And actually, the weak can actually have a say. And so based on that, and the second scripture I want to read is in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 23. It says, everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Is it permissible to meet now with 50 people? Yes, it is. Is it beneficial? Right now as an eldership, we don't believe it is. Everything is permissible, but not everything is constructive. So we might end up deconstructing something instead of building something. Nobody should seek his own good, but the good of others. And so friends, I'm missing community. I'm missing meeting together. Our government have given us a little door, but as elders, we are going to go with those who have got weak constitutions and some who don't have the faith right now to meet together. And we're going to say, it is permissible, but it's not beneficial. It is permissible, but it's not constructive. We are going to do something for the good of others, not just the good of ourselves. And we're going to make a statement to say that those in our church that have got preconditions are actually right now going to be honored by us continue to meet online, keep praying, keep encouraging you. We're going to keep preaching the word. And for the next three or four weeks, we're going to leave things exactly as they are. Now, I'm sure not everybody will agree with me, but that unfortunately is the loneliness of leadership. As a team, we have prayed, we have sought God. I would love you to read Romans 14 and 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and to stand with us at this time, even if you don't understand, to support our government, continually to support our government. There must be enormous pressure on Mr. Ramaphosa. Let's continue to back him and to bless him. And whatever pressures he's under, let's ask God to strengthen his heart and to strengthen his family and to strengthen his mind. And us as a church are going to continue to love you online. We're going to continue to pray for you daily. And we'll update you when we believe it is beneficial for everybody to get together. Those who eat only vegetables, those who eat meat, those who drive different cars, those who have different faith levels... We can't wait until we're all together again. We pray for that day. Our builders move back on site on Monday. We have got forward momentum in our church. But until such time, we're going to keep going like this. Heavenly Father, bless our church. Be with our people. I know, Lord God, we are missing fellowship, Lord God. But 50 is not an answer to us right now. And so we're going to go, Lord God, with what we believe Scripture has said. We are going to give, Lord God, preference to anybody in our community who is vulnerable, Lord God. And we're going to ask that you would protect us, you would bless us, you would be with us. And one of the scriptures I pray every day, Lord, John chapter 10, the Father is greater than all. He's greater than time. He's greater than lockdown. He's greater than COVID. He's greater than business. He's greater than the economy. He's greater than our government. He's greater than our eldership. He's greater than our church. And nobody can snatch us from the Father's hand. So, Father, I pray you put your hand around every member of our church as we charter the next three or four weeks of our church's life. Protect and bless our people. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much, Rory. And uh, an amazing uh, announcement and something which gives you an understanding as to what our stance is as a leadership and how we can get behind our president and the government at this time. I'd now like to give you an opportunity to join us as we take some time to worship and praise our Heavenly Father together. And after that, Stephen's going to preach the Word of God to us. Oh, victory, you have won. Victorious, you have come. What was stolen, you brought back to us. Oh, victory, you have won. Victorious, you have come. What was stolen, you brought back to us.
good he has overcome let all the earth every tribe and tongue we will sing it out he has overcome we will shout
you're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. Hello and welcome to week two of our new series from 1 and 2 Peter that we've called Rockstar. Last week, Rory started with what he called a shotgun approach to the letters, looking at the broad brushstrokes, the meta-narrative, the major themes that Peter unpacks in 1 and 2 Peter. Today what I want to do is I want to do a little bit of LASIK surgery, kind of a, a laser focused look at one verse in particular as we unpack the rest of 1 and 2 Peter. Because I think this is the verse that Peter hangs each one of those eight themes on. And just like LASIK surgery, it's, it will help us see clearly and focus on this and give us a better understanding of this big picture that we're going to unpack over the next few weeks on our series called Rockstar. And the verse that I'm going to look at is 1 Peter 1 verse 7. So Peter's writing to a, a number of churches in Asia Minor. They are going through their own crisis. They are facing unprecedented trials and persecutions. And so he writes to them and he's kind of building his case and gets to verse 6 of 1 Peter 1 and says, you know, so be truly glad there's a wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. And then here's our verse. It says, these trials will show Show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. Now, I want to stop there before we do a little bit of LASIK surgery, because what I normally do when I look at something like it, maybe you're the same. I start reading something like, be truly glad, there's wonderful joy ahead, and then he's talking about trials, and I'm like, hang on a second, I think you've got a few screws loose. You know, how can we rejoice in trials? How can we even find a gladness around what we're going through? What's up here? Something's wrong. Because I look at something like, these trials will show that your faith is genuine, and I just want to close the Bible. I don't need trials to show me whether or not my faith is genuine. I know my faith is shot through. It's full of holes. I know I live under this constant weight of disappointment and I haven't done enough and I'm not holy enough and I don't have enough faith. I don't need a trial to show me that. And what we've seen globally, they did a survey in Canada, North America and the UK, and they found that during this time of lockdown, 48% of people who used to go to church regularly, 48% haven't even logged on to their church's website once. And the reason for that is exactly how I described what goes through my heart and my mind when I approach something like this. Like, yeah, I've, I've been to too many church services where I've been reminded that I'm a failure, that I'm not measuring up. I've, I've been told too often and I'm aware too much of my shortcomings. I don't, I don't need to log on and, and be reminded of that. I don't need to go through 1 Peter and, and be reminded of how my faith is not measuring up, that there's no genuineness to my faith. And that is why I want to do LASIK surgery on this verse, because there's one word I want to show you. And this it says the following, it says, this is 1 Peter 1 verse 7 in the New Living Translation says, these trials will show that your faith is genuine. But look at that. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. The first thing you need to know about this verse that is crucial before we begin to hang these eight is that it's not a whether or not. It doesn't say these trials will show if your faith is genuine, but these trials will show that your faith is genuine. The Passion Translation has it like this, but these only reveal, these trials only reveal the sterling core of your faith. What a beautiful way to translate that. The sterling core of your faith. To put it another way, these trials come and God uses it to show you that He is the real deal. That this faith that you have, this gospel that you're banking on is the real deal. God is who He says He is and He will do what He says He will do. As He reveals to you the sterling core of your faith. Put another way, there's this guy by the name of Charles Blondin. He was a uh, daredevil back in the 1800s. He was an absolute showman, and one of his claims to fame was that he walked on a tightrope across the Niagara Falls. 
And so in a true showman style, he had a whole stadium of people on the American side of the Niagara Falls and a whole stadium of people on the Canadian side. And they were taking bets apparently of whether or not he'll survive. But he would walk with, you know, they have those poles that help them balance. He'd walk it and every now and then he'd nearly fall and the crowd would gasp and the ladies would swoon. And then he'd get halfway and he'd throw that pole away and then blow their minds. He, he would do somersaults on that tightrope, handstands. He would lie down. Uh, there's occasions where he walked blindfolded. One of my favorites, he, he sat down right in the middle and he had arranged a boat on the river just beneath him to come and stop. And he dropped a rope, pulled up a bottle of wine, and he had a glass of wine right in the middle of the Niagara Falls on this tightrope. Of course, the people were irate and fuming because they were on level four. And how could he do this? Shame on him. But my favorite thing that he did was he wheeled a wheelbarrow across that tightrope over the Niagara Falls, took the sort of the rubber casing off and the front wheel lay nicely on the tightrope. He wheeled it across and on the other side, they put a whole bunch of bags of potatoes, a man's weight worth of potatoes. And then he wheeled it back. And then in true showman style, he stood before the crowds and he said, do you believe that I could wheel a man across the Niagara Falls on this tightrope? And everyone's like, yes, you know, this is next level stuff. And then he turned to someone, he said, do you believe, sir, that you could be the man I wheel across the Niagara Falls? And the entire place went silent, you know, maybe a cough. Someone, <laughs> I need to go quarantine and disappearing beads of sweat. And essentially, that's what Peter is going after here. And that is what God is going after here. Because what uh, Mr. Blondine was doing was he was saying, it's one thing for you to believe something. It's a whole different story for you to trust in that thing. And where we're at, where, while we are facing these trials and tribulations, while we're in the midst of crisis, what happens is God moves us from believing in Him to trusting Him. You see, we can come on a Sunday we can sing those words and we can wake up in the morning and we can underline our Bible, you know, with all the colors of the rainbow. But to actually climb into that wheelbarrow and actually say, Lord, I believe that you are who you say you are, requires a little bit of nudging in the, in the small of our back, this pushing for us to step out in faith. And that is why Peter says these trials will show that your faith is genuine, the real deal. What you will find if you step into that wheelbarrow is that you are stepping into the hands of faithfulness, the God who you can bank everything on. So Peter says in his own words, right at the very end of 1 Peter, in 1 Peter 5 verse 12, he says the following, he says, just so you know, I've written to you, even though it's briefly, he says, I've written to encourage you and to testify that this is the true grace of God. Not what you're hearing there, not what the world is saying, not what you're reading on Instagram or Facebook, but this, this scripture, these promises, this God that we serve is the real deal. And then he says, stand firm in it. And that is what he's often. That's the first thing we have to understand as we approach this book of 1 and 2 Peter. As we look at these things that he's going to hold us to, these different themes that we can navigate safely by these eight stars because they are genuine. They are the real deal. As the Passion Translation says, the sterling core of your faith. It is a person. It is the living, breathing Jesus Christ, our Savior. That is what we are standing on. In 406 BC, I'm sorry, AD, it was an average day in the Roman Empire. You know, on one side of uh, the northern border of the Roman Empire, you had legions of soldiers lined up to keep the peace. On the other side of the northern border, you had a smattering of barbarians. And they would come down in uh, the, the winter months, year after year, these barbarians, and they would gaze on the promised land of the Roman Empire. It happened every time December, well, winter rolled in because these tribes would, you know, be struggling to uh, find food and, and the land was barren. And so they would come and they'd try as hard as they could to get into this promised land. I mean, they'd heard rumors that the Roman Empire had roads and running waters and arts and culture, free Wi-Fi. You know, they even heard that they were selling cigarettes here yeah, and, and they were keen to get their fair share of what was happening on the other side of this northern border. The only problem was the northern border was the Rhine River and the Danube, which basically it splices through um, Europe and would separate these Germanic and Goth tribes from a civilized Roman Empire. But in 406 AD, something happened that 
turned the world on its head, changed history forever. Europe had a cold front, kind of like we've had in Pretoria over the last few weeks, but with a few degrees lower, so much so that the Rhine River literally froze solid. Now, it, it wasn't unusual for the Rhine to, to ice up, but what was unusual was, in the words of Peter, they found that they were able to stand firm on this river. What would normally mean their death, you know, I can just imagine them climbing into a little raft and trying to get across to go and take on the Roman Empire. And the Romans see them and like, okay, we'll lob a boulder at you, off to the bottom of the river. What normally meant their death now suddenly was able to hold them firm. And they would test this ice. And not only could it hold a man or two, but it could hold an entire army. And when they discovered this, the barbarians crossed that Rhine in hundreds of thousands of waves after wave after wave of warriors. Now, you've got to understand, the Roman Empire had stood impregnable for about 1,200 odd years. They were a bastion of strength, a fortress that was sort of highlighting the achievement of mankind for nearly 1,200 years. So you can imagine the shock and awe on the faces of Roman citizens when they woke up in the city of Rome and found Alaric, the king of the Visigoths, and his horde on their doorstep. Apparently, they spent three days plundering and pillaging the city of Rome. If it wasn't bolted down, they took it or they destroyed it. Now, what's interesting for me and how this ties into 1 Peter is there's a, a historian, Thomas Cahill, and he extrapolates this all the way back to the very beginning, to that cold winter day in 406 AD. And he says, the moment that that river proved itself to be able to, that you could stand firm on it was the moment that the beginning of the end began for the Roman Empire. And this is what Peter is after. He's saying not only can you stand firm on the promises of God, but there's a reason why God wants you to know that he is faithful, why he wants to show this, this proven genuineness of your faith. Because we, just like those barbarians, we're outnumbered and outgunned. And before us lies God's promises for us, His inheritance for His people. And it's nothing like what's been before. The weightiness of His government upon us and His call, His anointing, the, the presence of His Holy Spirit among us is unlike anything we've ever faced. But what God wants to do is He wants to bring us across resting on Him and Him alone. And so we find that Peter unpacks us time and time again with these eight themes, that we can trust God. He T-bones all our earthiness and our worldly ways and our presuppositions. But he says, when you climb into that wheelbarrow, when you stand on that ice, you will find that God is faithful and he will not let you down. And so that's the first thing that we need to see. The second thing he says, these trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. I was uh, thinking while I was prepping for today, looking out in the backyard, we've got a pool there. And I was thinking, you know, I wonder if we pulled back the cover on a cold winter's day like we've had this week, if we could walk across our pool. Then I thought, well, how do you know? How do you test if, it will, if you can stand firm on ice? And I did a little bit of Googling and I found a bit of a rabbit hole. You know, there are videos and blogs and documentaries and mini Bear grill wannabes, you know, who break a hole in the ice and they climb in up to their armpits and show you how to navigate if you fall into a river. There's so much going on there. I kind of got lost in the detail. But there were two things that really caught my attention that I think help us understand what Peter's going on when he's talking about gold being refined as with fire. And the, the first one is this. They say that when you want to test whether you can stand firm on this ice, the first thing to recognize is that you cannot you rely on eyesight alone. And I love that because we are called to walk by faith, not by sight. And what Peter does throughout his letters is he will t say this. You can stand firm on this. This is God's word. But what we do is we go, but hang on a second. You know, uh, but Cyril Ramaphosa, he doesn't understand. And Peter has to say, no, no, you, you can't stand firm on that. I know it looks to the natural that that makes sense. I mean, you just think about it. If you look at, we, we're sending our kids back to school, but we won't open hair salons. It makes no sense. 
And you're wanting to say, but hang on a second. You know, to, the, to the natural eye, that does make sense. But Peter's going to remind us over and over again. He says, no, you can't stand on that. You can only stand firm on God's ways. And many times it takes a walking by faith and not by sight. When, when we look at our marriages, yeah, but my BFF says this and this. No, but scripture says this. And so he constantly pulls us back to walk by faith to say, okay, that is the wheelbarrow. I'm going to climb in. And the second thing that I noticed, and I, I never even knew this existed, but they talk about rotting ice or rotten ice. Rotten ice, for all intents and purposes, looks like it can hold a tank. It's like got everything going for it. As far as I can understand, there's like no uh, puddles of water, no cracks. It's a deep, rich, thick blue. There's no moving water on the edge. But on close inspection, if you notice any form of brown, they say, so uh, it might be pieces of plants, material or dirt, anything earthy, and that got my attention. What's happening is somewhere in that layer of ice, it's starting to thaw. And when it thaws, whatever's captured in it slowly floats to the surface. And so you get to see these uh, 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 sedimentary layers or bits and pieces of dirt, something earthy. And, they, and this is what they said. They said, when uh, ice is rotten, it's not safe for even a footstep, not even a footstep. For all intent and purposes, it looks like it could carry an army, but if it's rotten, if there's earth mixed into that ice, it's a sign that it's not safe for even a footstep. And so these are the two things that Peter addresses and this tension that he holds ongoingly, that we will find when we step out, but when we step out according to God's word, according to his ways, which are higher than our ways, his thoughts, which are higher than our thoughts, what we will find is that this is the real deal. But then he constantly says, not that. Stay away from that earthy mixture, those, those, that concern or complaints so that I don't really understand it. It's unfair or it's, stay away from that. That's rotting ice. It will not hold you. You might take a few steps out, but once you pass that point of no return, if that ice cracks, you've, you're done for. And so he calls us with our marriages, with authority, with our emotions, in persevering, in our growing in faith, with each one of these eight elements. He calls us back and says, you can trust in this. Guard your heart. Be wary of when there's earth mixed in. He says, we're going to be refined. There's, there's ways that God will, he will show us to, to bring us back. He said, but... If you put your hope and you lean completely on him, you will stand firm. And that is what God is doing right now as he moves us from belief to trust. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at those eight. The first one uh, that Peter deals with is our personal walk with God. Now, we've got a timer running and I've got less than five minutes before the trap door opens and I'm gone for and Peter deals with 15 very different things when he goes through our personal walk with God. So not only uh, would I never be able to cover those 15 and, and honor the time, but more specifically to do that in light of what, what uh, 1 Peter 1 7 shows us, I think would do injustice in the weightiness of each one of those 15. And so I spoke to Raw this week and I said, this is actually what I would love to do. Because when I look at this in my heart, and I'm sure the guys in the, the uh, eldership team and those who are leading life groups would want to do, we would love to sit in your kitchen, open the Bible, grab a cup of coffee and go through each one. Take your life, take those doubts, take those fears and, and show you how you can trust in God at this time. Where there's some earthiness creeping in, we would love to do that. But obviously under lockdown, it's impossible. But the thing is that this is an unprecedented time. The best way I can describe it is each one of these eight will echo into eternity. I mean, imagine five years, 10 years time, you're sitting with your children on your lap or maybe your grandkids who didn't go through 2020. And they're asking you like, what was it like you know, living within those four walls for months on end? You know, maybe you would say, well, yeah, it was amazing. For three months solid, I didn't wake up before 11 a.m. I never... I kicked off my slippers. I watched every episode of a Tiger King twice, and, and I'm in the Fortnite Hall of Fame, or I figured out how to smuggle cigarettes. You know, you, th there will be something, there will be a story that you tell. But what we do now and how we respond now, our stepping onto that ice now echoes into eternity. And what I see Peter calling us to is to recognize that actually we could look back on this time 
as that time when we encountered the life-giving presence of God. That when your grandchild asks you that, there's a sober moment that comes on you where you can say, you know what, that was the time I came face to face personally with a living, breathing life changing presence of God. It might be the time where you say, actually, you know, in 2020, I used to be crippled in this area, sexually, emotionally, physically. Uh, my marriage was barren and empty, my, my relationships or my business. But God came through over and over and over again. Maybe there's something like that Roman Empire that stood there for 1,200 years in your family line of brokenness and addiction and insecurities. So whatever it is, this is the time. What the way we respond now echoes into eternity. And in light of that, I said to Raw, what I would love to do, I would love to get into your kitchen. I would love to open scripture and go one point after another. So what are we going to do over the next five days? Is something like that with a lockdown feel. We're going to put together the uh, best way I can call it a, a, a daily devotion as such, but not quite that. What I want to do is I want to take these 15 from Monday through Friday, and we'll put it on all our social media platforms, YouTube and video, etc. Wherever you're watching me now, we'll make it available there. And in the morning, just go spend a minute or two going through a few of those points, giving you an understanding because where Paul starts, he starts with this <laughs> kind of off left field kind of statement. He says, gird the loins of your mind. What does that even mean? How do we do that? You know, all the way through to living in reverent fear of God. What does that look like for us? And to unpack that, take the raw ingredients of Scripture and create a feast as you sit at God's table each morning, giving you things to pray for, showing you ways of allowing God to speak and, and deal with these things to show so that through Scripture and through prayer and through the presence of God to show you how to navigate away from the rotten ice onto that which you can bank everything on. And trust that as we do this, that God will open up His plans and purposes for us, this inheritance that lies on the other side for us. And then Rory on Sunday is going to pick up on essentially that altar that we build. Again, part two of our relationship with God as we bring this first section of Peter to a close. So I want to invite you to that. I want to invite you to that, not because we want to dumb down and babysit, but because this for us is an unprecedented time. This, what we do and how we respond echoes into eternity. And we want to be there as God fulfills the promise that he says he will honor his word with signs and wonders following. And we want to be there as you step onto that ice, as you climb into that wheelbarrow. And we find on the other side that God honors his word with signs and wonders following of breakthrough of crippled areas becoming strong and us as a people, as community and as friends, walking and leaping and praising God together. So I will see you tomorrow morning. God bless. Thank you very much, Stephen. What an amazing word as uh, you've unpacked 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 7 for us. And I thought in terms of landing that beautiful message that you've shared with us, I want to continue reading the next two verses, uh, verses 8 and 9. And it says this, uh, as Stephen has unpacked that so well, and this is what it says. It says, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Verse 9, for you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And that's the reason why our faith would be proved genuine at this incredible time. The second thing I'd like to say as I bring this meeting to our close is you can see I've got my hat on and I'm wearing this as we continue to have a stance of solidarity, which means a sense of unity for the people that call 3C our home. And the reason being is that with level three lockdown, there are some people that are going back to work tomorrow and there are some people and organizations and companies that cannot go back to work tomorrow. And with this in mind, we still want to stand in unity and solidarity for those that are kicking off and those that cannot and really trust that God would give wisdom and his hand of protection over every single one of you wonderful people that call 3C our home. We stand in unity and solidarity with every single one of you. And I'd love to pray for us uh, as we go into the week that is ahead. If you wouldn't mind, can you bow your heads, please? Heavenly Father, I want to lift up every single one of these amazing people. We think of those that cannot go back to work at this time. 
Father, I pray for a sense of comfort, a sense of peace. Anxiety would have no place inside of those people's hearts or minds. And for those that are going back to work tomorrow, I pray, mighty God, that you would give them wisdom, you would give them strategies, you would give them the ability to do incredible and amazing things as your sons and daughters of the living God. That you would give them an understanding to be able to take back the ground that has been lost over the last eight weeks. You would give them strategies beyond their human understanding because you, mighty God, through your Holy Spirit, would be leading every single one of these wonderful men and women as they head into this week ahead. Go ahead of them, I pray, in the wonderful and mighty name of Jesus. Amen.